Hello and welcome to the AdTech Heroes podcast. In today's episode, we're going to talk about brand value and I'm delighted to be joined by Andres Ordonez. Andres is a proven creative leader with over 20 years of experience helping successful brands create uh, their narrative. Andres is currently a Chief Creative Officer at FCB Chicago and is part of the FCB's Global Creative Council. He has served as a judge on international awards shows, including One Show, Clio, New York Festival and Lisbon Advertising Festival and has received top industry accolades, including eight Andes, 20 Effies, and 94 Can Lions. Hi, Andres. How's it going? Hey, nice. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me as part of your show. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Really excited about the topic of brand value. Um, so, yeah, love to kind of kickstart with your career, the last 20 years. Uh, tell me more about it. Well, it's a lot to say, but... Um I'll try to make it really fast, but I, I was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. And when I finished high school, I moved to Miami because of my family. My mother used to live there. And, um, and I went to Miami Art School for art direction, actually. I, I had a great teacher that at some point in my life said, hey, you should check out this school. And I went there and that's where everything started. And I had the opportunity to travel with the school and working actually in Madrid and in London and in Minneapolis and back to Miami as part of the curriculum. And then um, once I graduated, uh, the first client, the first client, the first agency that called it was BBDL. So I moved to Puerto Rico and it was really nice. You know, like you're out of school, they call you to work on a Jeep account out of an island. So I was like, hell yes. And um, moved to there and uh, what it was supposed to be like a year journey turned into a seven year. Um, I met an incredible, person, Ramiro Millán, the former CEO of, of BBDO Puerto Rico, and he gave me all the opportunities of my career. I call him my godfather of, of, of advertising. And so he gave me the opportunity, and I grew there to become their CCO. So it was pretty fast track, and uh, we turned an agency to start doing getting recognized everywhere and doing great work for many clients. After that, for, my, for some personal reasons, um, I flew back to Miami to be with my mother in her last couple of months because she got she was sick. And I, again, was lucky enough to work at an agency, a local independent agency, Zuby, and start putting my uh, work and being surrounded by incredible talent on the Hispanic market. And there I stayed a couple of years, four years, and I moved, uh, I moved to Chicago to be part of Bravo, which is uh, it's part of YNR and starting to do a little bit of general market and Hispanic as well. And grew an office that it was tiny back then and we, we grew it. And uh, while I was there, we got offered to move with the team to New York as part of the YNR. But BBDO called again and there was a, always a love for the brand in many ways. And I had to leave for, no, for just personal reasons. So I wanted to go back and continue my career there. And um, I went there to do Hispanic, but uh, two years into the job, I became the CCO for General Market. And uh, we did incredible work with the Wrigley brand and Bayer and different brands. And uh, we built a really, really strong team. It got to a point where we were like, I remember that the joke was that there were 23 languages inside the office. And it was really beautiful because I believe that great ideas uh, transcend culture. Uh, we started doing work that started recognizing the agency, and um, three years ago, uh, FCB called to to come and become the CCO of their largest office, which which is the Chicago office. And with it, it came an incredible, incredible partnership with the president here, uh, Kelly Graves, and we started doing. I think I call it magic because uh, we we tend to see many agencies that either the, they have great numbers or great creative. It's really hard to achieve both, but I realize when you have the right partner, you get to do both at the same time. And last year, it was one of the best years in history for both things here. And in the case of creativity, we became the third most awarded in Cannes, number one in North America. So things starting to work really well. And again, just bringing more people with the same ideology and making sure that we do the, what it's right and that we give back and we use creativity to as an economic multiplier, but at the same time, creativity to feel change. And I think that combination has worked beautiful for us. Amazing. No, it sounds uh, super interesting, kind of your whole journey. And like you said, it's probably just a whistle stop 
of of what you've actually <laughs> what you've done and achieved and, and the kind of people you've met along the along the journey um just out of interest out of all the cities you've lived in which which has been your favorite uh it's hard i think every city has a lot to to bring i will tell you puerto rico some people say, ask me, where are you from? The people think I'm a, from a Puerto Rican in many ways. I always say I have half of a heart Colombian and half Puerto Rican because I owe them a lot. After my, my, my adult years, let's call it, it's been uh, where there. Miami is where a lot of my best friends sit. So there's that connection. But Chicago, it's a beautiful city. I've been here, well, we've been here already by for 11 years. It's a big city, but clean and organized. And uh, it has everything to offer than any other big city. So I think uh, uh, I would say right now, Chicago has been my favorite city for many, many, many reasons. Brilliant. And you touched on it, that you've had a network of people, um, you know, as you've grown in your industry and you've, you've um, learned a lot from them. Um, how important is it to have those mentors really early on in your career and how do you go about finding them if, if you know, if somebody's listening on this call and even in, in, in well, starting in the industry, you know, one year, two years? Um, yeah. How important is that to kind of associate yourself or, or, or kind of bounce ideas off, off a mentor? I think you get a. Well, first, you have to learn and do your research of who you're going to interview and, and talk to. But I also think I strongly believe in gut, gut feeling, you know, when you have chemistry with someone or not. And I think you got to find someone that you admire, that you look forward and that you hopefully one day can become that person. But to understand that uh, there is a connection in a, and an openness to talk. Uh, I, I normally say that I, I first look at meet people when I hire them uh, by, by gut than the, by a portfolio, because I believe that when you have the same values as humans and the same goals, you achieve great work. So I think uh, through my career, what I have found, it's incredible mentors that, that we share the same values or ideologies and goals, and we know exactly where we want to take things. So we kind of start fighting for the same things. And I think uh, find that, find that person that you strongly admire and that you're looking forward to, to become one day and that you believe that he has the same drive that you have and uh, you'll achieve everything. Also surround yourself. I don't believe that. I always say this is not a one-man show. Uh, you're only as good as your team. And it's as, as cliche as it sounds because we have heard many times that I believe that I, I, I couldn't be where I am with, without the people that I'm surrounded. And many of them have been with me up to 15 years. We have moved from one place to another together because that's how things happen. We do it together. We grow together. And we win together. Nicely put. Um, and... You know, it's clear you've had a lot of success in your career, but have there been challenges on the way up, you know, as you've been climbing that ladder um, to C-suite? You know, what, what kind of challenges have you faced along the line? I think, um, hey, I'm an immigrant at the end of the day in this country, and you and I talked about that one day. But being an immigrant, is, it's always harder. But I also think it's also, it's good to be an immigrant. When you're an immigrant, uh, you, give a, you, you have to fight a little bit fi harder than anyone else. Uh, we come to this country and nothing's given. Everything, you got to own it and and go for it. I think that's something that that I think has helped my career. I also have, um, we'll talk about that you have to go through life with like horse blinders. And in this career, if you look back or you look to the side, you, you lose. Because everyone, many people want what you want. And I think what I, I always been focused is about the people and the work. And everything comes after that. If you if you really take care of your people and you really focus on what is the best work for your clients, uh, everything else falls. It, it, the next promotion or the next salary, the next uh, round of awards, everything comes in. So it, being just looking forward and understanding that, yes, there, it might be harder for one or the other, but uh, everything is possible. So I think being an immigrant, actually, it's a kind of a superpower. Amazing. Great way to look at it. I think being an immigrant has, it's obviously, like I said, it's its own challenges, but it's how you react to those challenges, right? And how you're um, going to overcome them. So you could kind of feel bad of, on yourself or, you know, feel a certain way. But if you kind of dust yourself off and kind of 
you know um be positive and and, and try to flip any situation i think that's you know it, it's a real uh, judge of character uh you know how, how you react to these types of things and i totally totally get it yeah i also think that as an immigrant you come i always say you have a different lens how you see things creativity everything in between how you see the world how you treat people how everything and i think when you get to any country in the world as an immigrant you are more more open to learn about it and things that might be obvious for many for you are new so you kind of put it back into the system and they're like yeah, i never thought about that because they, it's been in front of them all these years so that's actually why the composition of the art team is so international in many ways and different backgrounds diversity everything in between because the more lenses that we have, the stronger that the work is. So I think that's actually been something really, really nice as as, as my background to bring into to the company and to this industry. And have you enjoyed that challenge, you know, moving to the different cities around the world and adapting to the surroundings? You know, you've got really kind of cosmopolitan areas and uh, the likes of London, and New York, probably the weather's not as great as Miami or, 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 or in, uh, in, in LATAM. So, yeah, how, how have you reacted to, you know, those circumstances? Well, uh, by the end of this podcast, you're going to say, this guy has too many sayings. But I learned that from the guy from Puerto Rico. And, uh, he used to tell me the only constant in life is change. And, um, and it's true. And I love it. You have to embrace change. I think that uh, if you become still in this industry, you become obsolete in a second, you know, like you disappear in a second. So I think I love change. I love the challenges. I love trying new things. I, I love um, just being challenged by other brands. I love being jealous about someone else's work. Um, and it's what it pushes you. And I think that um, we become better creatives as we go out into the world and explore and get to have new experiences. And part of it is maybe moving cities and trying mm -hmm. a new thing. And try, that's how we come we become better at it in many ways. I think that's a, that's a good point. So ch change, is, change is good, but it doesn't have to mean moving cities, right? If you need that change, it could be a, a, a different function within your team, your, the company you work for, a different company, um, a whole different perspective, right? So it could mean many, many different things. Yeah, it's uh, when I started here, actually, now that you mentioned that, food count and building. I mean, everyone knows us for FCB, but there's an and. And in between that, no one talked about it. And I said, like, that is where the magic happens in the end. And the end is a little bit of that change. It's when we, th when we think about the work and you add the end, it's like, oh, we thought about this. And what else? And, and the, that end is what it gives you a little bit. It pushes your limits into another way of rethinking how you've seen things. And it's where a lot of the great work has happened for us. So it's about understanding, just changing a little bit. Think about it differently. Amazing. Um, and kind of like fast forward to now then, uh, how how does a typical day look for you? A typical day for me, I'm a morning person. So for example, today, 4.30 in the morning, woke up, I go and work out and then go back home, uh, make sure that I spend time with my daughters before they go to school, help with the house a little bit and then come to the office. Uh, I love being in the office. I love being with people. Um, Right now we're coming three three days a week. Uh, I put a lot of time here, honestly, uh, as much as I can uh, on the work. And then around 7, 8 p.m. I go back home pretty much. So that's kind of like a little bit if I could put in the routine. Mm -hmm. But there's always travel and things like that. And, and I just like I always say the other part that I like to do is sit and work a lot with the teams because I believe that creativity is a muscle. And if you don't work out like any other muscle, if you don't work it, it will just start uh, losing its, 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 its energy or its power. So I try to dedicate team a, a little bit of my time during the day to make sure that I can go and just just be a, an art director, which I love too, and just sit with the teams and work. And has that been difficult in the last couple of years with lockdowns and whatnot, um, spending face-to-face -to -face time with teams, or has it been equally done virtually? Well, I started this job at FCB, and five months into it, I pandemic hit, and it's, it's an office of 700, so it wasn't. I didn't get to meet everyone. So I started doing more one-on-ones, and um, I got to know a lot of people more in a personal level, which I appreciated from the pan pandemic. That was one of the positives that I could tell you. Uh, reviews were hard because I am maybe old school. I like to put walls and put paper and scratch and write and do everything on the wall. 
and let it sit and walk away and come back and walk away and come back. I like the exercise because uh, I feel that sometimes at the first shot, we might not see an idea or might see something. So that party was not good for me in general. So I did, it started coming very early with my partner, with Kelly. It started coming early and, uh, and the minute that we could be open, we started coming as little teams to look at, at, at the wall. So that was the one thing that I missed. Uh, but again, we were able to do incredible work during uh, the pandemic at the same time. So that just showed that we created a bond, even though we were very connected, even though we were so separated. So Amazing. we adjusted. Change again, change. Constant change, right? Yeah. Um, and to- talking about change, how how is that? Um, how have you worked with clients then? And, and has that changed over the last couple of years? Um, was there a lot more kind of meetings going going to their offices or uh, and now yeah. so yeah we much yeah. obviously there is every client is different many clients uh, haven't even returned and many have so um maybe it's a latino thing but i we like to hug and be together you know and um, i miss that because i feel that even presenting work it is different you know like yeah, we, we talk with our hands and suddenly I'm here in Little Square trying to sell an idea. And uh, I always remember people say like, oh, you're so passionate about the work. And part of the, way of, of the game is that sharing that passion. And when you believe in the work, it just shows. People can feel the energy when you believe in the work. And I think um, this world of Zoom and everything else just, just killed us a little bit of that energy. So I'm trying to, to, to fly as much as I can or I'm, as more as clients are opening their doors. And, um, and the same way that he was here in the office, we, I think Zoom made us understand that we could create more personal connections with them, getting to know them. Even if the dog walks on the back, it was like, oh, you got a dog? I got a dog. And then we will talk about the dogs. Little things like that, we, we started to learn like personal things that I, I don't think I would have ever known if it, wasn't, if it wasn't because of the pandemic. Uh, LC would have been a nine to five job from a client. And then you would have just see it one, only one way. So I think uh, you got to, I think there's, there's, there's positives also on that. Yeah, I think you get to understand who, you, who you're talking to a little bit more and get a, get a sense of their environment, whether it's their home environment, their work environment. Um, whereas, you know, otherwise you, you've kind of, you're meeting at a, a certain place, right? That was meant for work or for a meeting. Whereas, you, you, you know, like now I'm in my kitchen, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't tell, <laughs> you, you yeah. couldn't tell that. And, and we recorded a podcast a few hours ago and uh, the, the guy was uh, in his daughter's room because it had the best light. And, and one, one side of the room was all pink, but he goes, he doesn't want to show that side of the wall. But I was like, show it, you know, um, it's, it kind of um, brings that personality and that humanness if that's a word you know back back to the conversation so uh no i think that's super important yeah i agree it's incredible i mean that human connection is everything i also think that the 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 ideas need you need to spend time with ideas to understand ideas sometimes and a 30 minute call doesn't do justice to great work sometimes totally um, so yeah, I suppose a big part of our conversation um, today is, is is talking about brand value. So what what does brand value mean to you? I think cons- uh, I, I gave this talk a couple of years ago at, w- at one show in China about ba- not values, but about how there's this perception that customers have given their back to brands. I don't I don't believe so. I actually you just gotta open your whatever your preferred social media platform it is, and you see them. You see them people with a Starbucks cup or with their Nikes or with their, I don't know, you can call it whatever, it's your passion. And I believe what it is, is that they realize that um, more than ever, uh, customers are aligning their, their human values with, with the values of the company they're working on. So I think brand values have become more stronger than ever. Um, we, we work on the reputation side of, for example, Walmart, and we started doing that work for the last two years. And when you look at the connection and how perception has changed and even on sales the what it what what it uh, what they think it was this this had to do with the business it's incredible it's incredible what people understand once they know what your values are and uh, and how connected they are that they just become loyal to you so i think brand values is one of the most important things right now that are happening in our industry you know it's not the one thing to do i always believe that people say like oh we got to do it 
no, no, you don't have to do it. But you have to be open and share the reasons why you exist and the reasons why you're important in my life so I can connect with you and I'll become loyal to you. And in a, in a super competitive landscape, right, in any, in any industry, how would these brands, you know, stand out from the competition in your opinion? I think we all, we all stand for something else. I also believe that um, values that are eh, values, brands that are very honest, you can you can see it and you can feel it, and it wins your heart. Brands that are just being opportunistic because of whatever it's happening culture at that moment, uh, customers can smell it and reject them instantly. So it is very important, and I also believe that, like any other brand, or like I believe, like humans, we are all brands in many ways. We all stand for something different. So that's what it makes us different in a category where it's the sea of sameness. Sometimes values could be the one thing that will make you pop from the rest. Makes sense. Um, and tell me, tell me more about purpose-driven marketing. Have you got any examples as well? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a little obsessed with that. Uh, actually, we created most a lot of the some of the best ideas last year on on, on, the, on global came out of this office and uh, we, even for, for the city of Chicago, we did it for Walmart, we did it for Cox Communication. And uh, so we've done a lot of purpose-driven work. Um, some projects that started with a very little thought and a little bit of project and then had an incredible impact on the brand. Uh, and now what we're seeing is that there's more investment and uh, the city the, and our clients are just saying like, what's next? And understanding the importance of, of purpose-driven work. So from bedtime stories for Walmart to the Hawk Project for Cox Communication to Boards of Change for the city of Chicago, those are just three of the many examples that we have out of this office of, of purpose-driven work and, and the impact is having not only in their brand, but in cities, communities, and and sometimes as an example for many other countries. And, uh, and because you've worked in so many different countries, do you see any differences between what different countries are doing or the same brand across different regions? Are they, uh, you know, looking at purpose-driven marketing differently? Depending on the brand. Obviously, we all, every brand and every country and every city has a very different uh, thing that we need to tackle. But at the end of the day, we're all humans. And I believe that if you tap onto a true insight or, or and something that it just gets crossed from one way to another, there, there, there could be ideas that can transcend from one place to another. But most of them are very relatable to a moment in time and, uh, and, a, and a cause that could be very different. So obviously that changes from one country to another. So brands have to understand what is your brand platform and, uh, and fulfill it with all these purpose-driven work that it adjust of the location where they are at, what's happening. And, and you said as consumers, the, as, as consumers, we can easily see the difference between a, a brand just pushing purpose for the sake of it, or, you know, if it aligns with their revenue targets, et cetera. Um, do you have any examples, and you don't have to name names, of, of when it hasn't been done well, or you can see it's very forced um, in, their, in their strategy? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I can't say names because I don't know if one of them will be my next client. <laughs> but I will say, you know what? It's uh, we we were talking about it the other day with one of our clients. Uh, they they're not doing it wrong, but we were just talking about the brief about sustainability. Everyone's talking about sustainability. Everyone is like, by year X, we're gonna do this. By year, but they all have the same talk. But when you really look deeper into it, are you really doing something about it? Or are you just being one more on the whole world talking about by 2050 who you're going to become? And I feel that the world, it's not, it's overwhelmed of all the promises and they're trying to live on the, what I can do now as a brand versus what I can do in 20 years from now. And I think that's what it's, it's starting to see. So there's always these topics around the world that everyone jumps in. And, but do, you, do you, they truly are doing something? And I think we have to put a mirror into to ourselves and to our brands to say like, are you just being part of a conversation or are you truly, truly doing something for that cause? Yeah, sustainability is definitely one that's popping up a lot more now, ethics, um, but also diversity as well, right? So um, after BLM, I think a couple of years back, 
it, it did feel t- from for me on the outside to looking in on some brands and uh, some companies that they were just doing it for the sake of it because it was hot topic they wanted to um, kind of communicate their own messaging around that so do, have you seen that in the diversity space as well where um, yeah it's again might not seem as, as genuine yeah I think uh, diversity is an incredible one obviously for for, for for all of us and I think that um, we shouldn't it should be part of everything um, but for example when BLM and all these things happened one of the projects that we did it was for the city of Chicago and everyone was talking, oh, we're doing this, we're doing this. And we were like, no, 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 we got to act on it. Or else there will be no change. History will keep on repeating itself over and over and over. And we know that we're not going to create something that will change the world in one day to another. But if we can start adding these acts, it, it will do it. And uh, it's when we did Words of Change and he had an 8% more registration for that year to pick the right leaders at, at the government so we can drive change. So I think... Every, we saw many politicians making promises about the change in their cities and what they're going to do and everything else that, well, Major Lightfoot here in the city of Chicago said, like, no, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to drive more registrations. We're going regi- we we're gonna to drive more voting people to the booth. And we're going to pick up the right leaders so our people, our community can see change. And I think that's the kind of things that we have to do more. And a big part of that, from the company is is the culture right that they kind of um maybe top down bottom up whatever whichever way you want to look at it there needs to be a a, a strong culture within the brand so yeah how how important to you would you say it is 100 company culture is yeah Yeah. it's it's like um you need to have people like when we started this this podcast is like you have to have people at the table with different lenses else you can't do it there's some, there is a background, there's a history and things that even though we think we know, there are things that we just don't know. And I feel that um, it was the other day on a, on a client call and it was three agencies. And I think just to, to, be, to, to, to just talk about us, but the client said it's incredible the diversity in this room for, from you guys. And actually, you looked at the board of, of all the people and, and, and we were the only diverse team. We had people... Latinos, Asians, Black. Uh, we have represented the LGBTQ. Everyone was on, the, on, that, on that table. And I were like, listen, to your, in order for us to make sure that we do the right work, we have to have the right people surrounding it. Else we, we, we might, it's a fine line. When it comes to diversity, you're always walking a fine line of doing right or doing not so right. And I think that's why you have to do that. And I think something that it's incredible here at um, our agency is that we have a person, the director of diversity and inclusion. There's say, 12 ERGs. There is a whole system on how we go through when we have an idea to make sure that we're doing what is right for the people and the different groups and that we're representing on each of the brands. So uh, people need to be more strict about it, uh, need to learn more about it, and need to change from uh, inside out versus trying to change outside when you don't even have the people inside yourself that can help you get there or be those um, the ones that you can bounce ideas and tell you if it's you're doing what it's right you know definitely and, and what part has FCB played within that when it comes to talking to the brands you're working with get, getting them to you know sh- show their their value and, and and run purpose-driven marketing how, how, have, how has FCB kind of contributed to that actually it's, uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. We, we have, like, the person I was talking, his name is Mark Wilson. He runs the whole practice. And uh, him with a, a group of people created the whole system on how to look at diversity and inclusion and everything. And the first thing that we did, it was obviously start influencing the work, but then also starting showing, presenting it to clients. And then the, the, the reception from clients was incredible. Like, calls where you have 80 people from a company just listening about diversity and inclusion, how it needs to be approached, how do we should be looking at advertising, the importance of, of values, the, the purpose-driven work. What are we doing? Are we being opportunistic? Like how do, when to take a pause and really look at the work and understand, uh, do we have the right representation of the work? Uh, all the different things. It's, it's, a, it's a process, but once you understand it, it just becomes easier. And I think that in order for us to make sure that it would work, it wouldn't be only from us, we were the first ones to change and adapt and learn, but also understanding that we can give the same tools to, with our clients and they can share theirs 
so we can find that that connection or that interaction where we can do what it's the right work and the best work. So would you say it's a lot a lot of it's kind of bouncing ideas from your side, working with the client, understanding what what they want want to achieve um, at, from a, at a brand level. Um, okay, that, no, that makes sense. So so how how do you think brands then would use for example, storytelling, or how, how would they connect with their customers? And, and again, do you have any examples of, of where that's, that's been done well? It's storytelling. I mean, storytelling, I always say it's, it's, it's an incredible thing. I love, I love, I love, love, love storytelling. Uh, and I, I also think that it is the one thing that never changes since the beginning of humanity. Stories are the ones who has been passed through time to learn and understand what we're all about. And I think and learn from it. So I think uh, you're seeing it more. Uh, one that I that comes to mind is uh, Beats when they did uh, "Love Me or Love Me Not." If I don't I believe that's the title, but last year work that they did, incredible work about talking to the, the black community and everything else in between. Uh, it was an incredible piece of work that it that we all saw, we all loved, and we all shared. And I think uh, you realize the power. That way, it's incredible. Like the stories that you love, you always tend to take them, learn from them, and pass them to the next person. So I think that's kind of the kind of work that I believe it's super strong. And then, how important is creative within that storytelling, and how have you seen that play its part within the whole kind of uh, marketing spend or the campaign that that the brand is running? Well, creativity for me is everything. If you ask me, obviously, I, I, I love the creativity and everything around it. I believe that creativity is the one who makes, who adds like that, that sparkling and that little thing and turn things around to connect to, to humans, to make it interesting. We just take all those stories or those insights and we turn them into something that it's magical and that it makes you feel something. So I think creativity has the power to, to make you feel something and do something. So... It's a, it's a power, it's an incredible power to, for us to, to make people believe and change and try something new. So I think that that's it. Else is just one more story. It's like if you give a kid a book without illustrations, we know that it will be too hard for them to read. But when you add the illustrations, the right things and everything, that's when you create that engagement. I feel the creativity brings that to storytelling. As well. Not just kids, to be fair, even for me. I, I find I, I need illustrations my, in my books. As <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think that's a good point. And w what does that creativity mean to you? Because I can imagine creativity means different things to different people, right? So if you worked in the data team, an audience team within a, in a brand, they might say to you creativity is in how you're targeting a consumer and you know the, the story behind that. Whereas if you go to designers, they might tell you creativity is the copy, literally the creative copy that you're seeing on, on TV or the radio or whatever it might be. So what does creativity mean to you? Well, great question. I think creativity, it's a superpower. And uh, now I'm so obsessed with your question about superpowers, but I think creativity is a superpower. When you, we have this thing that we, it's like we have our, minds and antennas, I call it, open all the time, and ideas come, insights come, and then when they come in, they just don't come in as they are, but they come in and you flip them and turn them into something. I feel that creativity, what it does is that it takes regular information and it turns them into something interesting, something that connects. Um, so creativity has the power to, to make things interesting, beautiful, magical, and also has the power to make people do something. And I think um, that's what I love. So that I always say creativity can be an economic multiplier, but also has the power to fuel change. And creativity doesn't have to, you know, doesn't have to come in a board board meeting or, a, you know, your office, right? I, I've, I've, I've thought the most creative things just, you know, on the commute to work or, you know, just playing with the children or something, you think you think of something and you jot it down on your phone or something like that, right? So I think that's the beauty of creativity as well. It can come to you at any point in time. Yeah, creativity, it's different for all. And we, I think people that are, are creatives, I think we all are creatives, honestly. We all imagine things one way or another. People might find creative ways to do 
pouring stuff into incredible stuff and they don't have to be in our industry. But I think uh, creativity is when you're open to it, when you're open to, to, to imagine things and create things and everything, it's, it's 24 seven. It can happen at two in the morning, you wake up like, oh my God, I never thought about this. And then you write it and you keep sleeping. There's people that um, you learn to unlock creativity or make it a little bit cleaner. If that's a, I don't know if that's a way to say it, but for example, I like running. And when I have a, a hard thing to figure it out or what could I do with this, I go for runs. And I, the reason why I do it is because for me running, what it makes my mind is be hyper-focused. And I can take one thought and just keep thinking about it over and over and over and over. Versus when I'm still, I'm a little bit like looking all around and like, what if we do this and that and that? So, so we all have to figure out how do we channel that creativity and, uh, and what are the moments or things that make us more creative. And I think we, we all, there is no formula uh, at all. We just got to just learn and be receptive to it to understand when, is it, when, when are the best moments or times where, when that can unlock a little bit more power or less power or what makes it cluttered. And I think when you realize that, it's, it's incredible the things that you can do. And is the morning the best time for you? So you said you wake up at 4.30. Um, I, I, I probably would say I sometimes wake up at 4.30, but that's of no, that's not because of I, that I want to, it's because of a, a crying child or you know, <laughs> something on, on those lines. Um, and, I, and I tried to go straight back to sleep. Um, so would you say you're at your most creative in the morning where, you know, like some people I talk to, they say, you know, it's great to wake up in the morning, go to the gym um, and, and log on to do work because nobody is awake then or nobody's around to kind of put your mind or uh, you know and, and get you to do certain things and you know you're 100% focused on, on what you need to do so would you say that applies think, to you as well yes I think uh my creativity uh, until like <laughs> three four in the afternoon it's it's on at nights too, but I also feel that maybe I'm just more wired in the morning in many ways. I think I'm more creative when a problem is in front of me. Actually, when, when, there are, and when I say problem, it's uh, more of a challenge. Uh, I'm less creative and I get a little bit like anxious when there are nothing in front of me. So I think uh, as creators, we, we have a little bit of that. When there's a little bit of stress and a little bit of tension, a little bit of what am I going to do with this is when creative kicks in and it's incredible because then you're like, it never leaves you. It's like, what if we do this? What if we do that? And then you start trying to figure it out, things around you and start pushing towards different things. So for example, yesterday we were like trying to figure out something for, for a program we want to do for a brand. And we were on a very different talk on a very different brand uh, with one of uh, our strategists, but he and I had the same brief for that other brand. And we we're in a call, super random call. And then this thing popped. And I said, sorry, and say, Joe, what about the table? And then he's like, yes. And then from there, we had to chat a little bit and organize and that turned into a whole thing. But that tells you that when that thing is in your mind, it still gets you, it doesn't leave your mind until you figure it out or find the solve or something interesting to do with it. So creativity changes it doesn't have really a time but uh we all have more energy in different times of the day and i think that helps too but also but i also believe that there are triggers for creativity and would you then say knowledge plays a big part of that as well because you're creative because you've also got the the knowledge in certain situations and and how that would how, how that would influence the creativity as well yeah i also think that surrounding yourself I always say like, do not, uh, there's a tendency or used to be a tendency where uh, when you were a creative director or not, people just sit and wait to see the ideas. And I think that's the death of creativity. I believe creativity, like I said a couple of minutes ago, it was, it's muscle. So I think hands-on working with teams, it just keeps on helping you be better and more efficient and uh, get, having clear and faster ways to, to answer any challenge that is in front of you. Amazing. Um, I just had to ask d this question specifically because you mentioned you've been on a judge on, on many different panels and you've got tons of experience there. Um, you know, it's, it's probably slightly off topic to be completely honest, but 
when, when have you seen a good award entry and what yeah what makes a, a, an amazing award entry is it you know multiple things is it one thing in particular you know what what grabs your attention when you're you know going through hundreds of different award entries it, when you're it when is you're on a it panel? is it is no different than every day, honestly, in many ways. Well, I wish we had that level of creativity every single day. But the, what I mean is when you look at a wall and you see 30 ideas, there's always that one or two idea that it just hits you on a very, very different level. It makes you mad on a good way, jealous in a good way. And it's, I always say it's something that I wish I would have done. And... Um, it makes me just rethink everything and it just sets a new bar personally for me. So on the judging room, when I'm, when I'm looking at work, I have that thing. When I'm looking at this work, I'm like, this is, I can't, there is, there's no doubt it is the best thing. Also, by being able to see all the work, it just pops. It, there's, 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 it's complete, there's no question about it. And then even though you might be like, I love this, I think it's incredible for all these reasons, you get to discuss in the room with with all the different judges and it becomes unanimous in a second because everyone feels that so great creativity great work takes care of itself so because and that's how it is like, honestly if, if all the work always was great it was it would be impossible but great ideas they just pop from the rest and it's it's just it's it's that easy sometimes in the room sometimes the hard part when it comes in categories sometimes you're judging categories that in a good year, they might have a couple of really, really good ones. So then deciding a Grand Prix, it becomes really interesting because everyone loves different work for many different reasons that are completely understandable, but you have to pick one. That's where it gets really, really hard. That's why when you look at numbers, I believe it's like less than 5%, 3% gets a gold and then obviously a Grand Prix because those are the, the jewels out of those categories that deserve to be celebrated and being lifted all the way up. And for you then, is it safe to say then storytelling outweighs the numbers and the, the results? Or do you still have your lens on which you look, is storytelling, looking at quantifiable data? People need to uh, we we need to be great storytellers. It could be from, obviously from a film standpoint, I don't have to say a great film, it's a great film. But when it comes to case studies, sometimes you look at case studies and we're like, there's like, what are you trying to tell me? And I think... I suggest every time, let's look at it, look at it. And we do a lot of rounds because you have to tell the story and simplify it as much as you, so it's easy to understand. So it's two minutes of information that I need to be very clear, or the jury needs to be very clear, what were you trying to do with this? And I think that is one of the hardest thing for many. And sometimes I believe great ideas might be, might, might lose power because they just didn't know how to tell the story. Amazing. Um, one final question. So I think you've answered it already. So what would your superpower in marketing be? Is, is, are you sticking with creativity, Andres? I couldn't say that my superpower is creativity no. because that would be, I don't know, it would make me feel like, I don't know, arrogant to say. I, I feel that uh, creativity is everyone's superpower. I believe uh, that my superpower is being, it's, it's around people. And uh, I believe that when you put, put people first, everything falls after. And uh, I had one creative one time that's like, I never get it. For some reason, we end up doing stuff that we never thought we were gonna do. And then we realize, well, Andres told us to do it. So I have a superpower about convincing people in a good way and trying to, to, to share our energy. So I think my superpower is around the energy and the passion that I have for the work. And uh, I always say when having great energy uh, for the work and passion, it's something that it's, it just gets everyone around it. So I, I feel that my superpower is to bring people together and make them believe and do great things amazing great answer um okay i think that's all we've got time for in today's episode i think we could have just gone on and on um <laughs> which is a great which is a great way to thank think you of so it much. But, um thank you for your time today and uh, yeah i'm sure we'll catch up soon
Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the time and being, being part of, of your podcast. And I hope to see you in Cannes. Definitely. <laughs>